Is this being video, the workshop? Okay, good. Okay. So the workshop meeting, September 13, 2016, 6 p.m. It's about 6.08. Um, the agenda is number one, discussion on the review and enforcement of architectural plans regarding commercial structures that are built, that are being built, and uh, Matt Beata is going to speak on that. Sure. Um, I wanted to bring this up for, I guess, a few reasons, but the one, the main part is just um, for uh, educating myself on how that process works, exactly who approves the plans, and uh, you know who who recommends changes and then who uh, enforces that those plans are uh, built according to what's been approved and what our um, you know review guidelines um, for our commercial uh, packet have in there so it was more of, of just I, I felt like it was it would be good to have a conversation on that so everybody on the Planning Commission uh, when we approve these these drawings or what we see or don't see um, what happens on the back end of it the um, you know obviously any building that's going to be built now is, is going to be there throughout our lifetime so I think it's important um, again not just to review the, the plans but and approve them but also in, enforce them so uh, I guess I'll leave it up to Mr. Hall or, or whoever knows how that process goes down currently. First off, they got to bring us in a plan to see what we need to do from there. And once we get that, then uh, we have a staff review on it, uh, which uh, we bring in the uh, city engineer okay. to go over the, you know, the, over the plans. Okay. And uh, then it's submitted. Uh, he, if there's any resubmittals, he, he usually get that within the first week, right, Will, as far as any resubmittals on uh, your review? Yes. Michael Will. <clears throat> and then they have so many days to get the, get the resubmittal in mm -hmm. before we send the packet out to, to the Planning Commission. Okay, so does Will then, do you review the architectural plans yeah that was curious to me too do you have any architectural people on staff or something that can review like if the plans drawn incorrectly um, we I well. see let's back up um, the design the requirements found in the design review manual um, are applicable to uh, specific submittals that are seeking approval from the Planning Commission. Uh, as we've discussed in the past, there are some scenarios in your documents that are um, in um, contrast to each other. And this is one of them. The zoning ordinance in Article 15 has a one two three four five has five criteria of when a development is subject to being reviewed against the requirements in the design review manual then the design review manual itself has four requirements outlined that that, that is entitled development subject to design review only one, one has five, one has four. Between those nine, only one are paired with each other. So three on this side and four on this side aren't mentioned in the other one. So as a staff, we're kind of left with um, some challenges on when does design review apply and when does it not. So that's one issue. When, it, when staff has determined that it does apply based on what's in those two documents, and I'll tell you that we as a staff have been very uh, conservative, meaning that if there's any question, we just say, yes, it applies. Um, so far, that hasn't been challenged. 
by an applicant, uh, but it's only a matter of time. So um, once it's been determined that the design review requirements are applicable to a development, then the required submittal information that is outlined in the design review manual, the color photographs, the um, elevation renderings, the material list of what, what the outside materials are going to look like, uh, the, the percentage of materials on each building face. You guys are familiar with those criteria. You know, most uh, recently, I guess, would be the Hardy's would be the example. So when that's determined, then that packet of information is required for the applicant to, be sub to submit that information with their site plan. And the review that the staff conducts of the site plan and that information happens concurrently. Whereas in the past, it has been brought to you as a planning commission as two separate agenda items. One would be the site plan for a specific development, and the next, very next agenda item would be design review for a specific element. Well, nowhere in the book did it require a separate agenda item, and staff at the time felt like in order to be more consistent and provide a more comprehensive review, we just felt, felt like there was no reason not to review both under the same agenda item. It's, it's one development, let's, let's review the entirety of the proposed development both against the site plan requirements and the design review manual and then anything that comes out of that discussion could either be approvals contingent upon you know those discussions or not so in a long way or in a roundabout way the answer is yes we review as a staff and my staff we review the applications that fall under the design review criteria for those design review elements. We do not have an architect on board, but if, I mean, if you read through a licensed architect, but if you read through the, de the uh, design review requirements, it's my opinion that an architect isn't necessarily required, um, but that's, uh, that's just my opinion. Well, let me bring up something. Okay. There's a project that was done recently. Mm -hmm. um, I was in the architectural field for a long time. Mm -hmm. I know what elevations, renderings, and I know what they're supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. This drawing was done, this, this uh, you know, elevation of the west wall was done. Mm -hmm. It showed in full um, bold line a parapet wall. Mm -hmm. So I assumed that there was a parapet wall on the west elevation. Mm -hmm. When it was built, there was no parapet wall. Mm -hmm. And it looks awful. Mm -hmm. And I questioned with a previous person that was here, um, you know, why was, it, uh, why was that parapet wall missing? And I, I got the answer, well, y'all approved the plans. Well, we approved the plans as drawn. Right. It was drawn incorrectly because what that was was the background, the wall on the east side. Uh -huh. And if that was the case, it should have been screened back to let us know that it was on, you know, that it was the, the parapet wall from behind and that there was, you know, there was not one, uh, you know, on the west side. What development? Well, I hate to, uh, you know. I mean, <laughs> the, the meeting place church. Okay. And I, I don't want to beat on the meeting place church. It's just, it is what it is. And, and, and the meeting place church, because it is zoned a residential zone, did not fall under the design review manual criteria. So their renderings don't, don't matter? Correct, basically. We recently had that on the agenda item. That's no longer the case, right? What's that? That that churches are treated as commercial structures um i guess that's why that item came the agenda from item i think matt i think the agenda item was to change the permitted uses in commercial zones to allow churches to be a a legal permitted use 
But I don't think it addressed the design review aspect at all. That, just, that doesn't even so make sense to me that yeah, a church is not commercial. Yeah. I, I don't disagree. <laughs> A church's parking lot, a church's parking lot is one thing, but a, a church where people gather and that's not, if that's not considered commercial, then how do we even, you know, do the safety issues? I, I don't disagree. How is the inspection process on the backside of that? Would somebody take the the approved plans and visit the site before the final to approve as built. Time to get the uh, trees and shrubs in in the planting season, so yeah, they've been extended. Right now, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, I talked to him today and, and assured him that once he got that in, that we would need to. I don't think he really understood what the as-built drawings was, but Mr. Goff did, his, his engineer, and he actually stated in a meeting here that he would make sure that, that he had the as-built drawings done. It, so I think part of Matt's could, question was, what happens if somebody makes a change, and what, how does that change occur? It obviously has to go back to the city manager, right, for review and approval. It should. <laughs> go back to the city manager? Well, to or, someone within, yeah. Probably well, I would think the building inspector would be the one who goes out, right? And I mean, well, the building inspector. He, he, building inspector. Forgive me, because I'm brand new, obviously. To this, no, that's okay. I would just. Normally, what happens if there's a change requested by the owner or the architect or site conditions or whatever occur at the site, that that has to be submitted for review and approval by someone. But I, Assuming it makes some change to either exiting or fire alarm system or anything uh, significant it's got to be reviewed and approved by a legislative body i think that is the, like, the inspector correct me if i'm wrong he's the guy that checks it afterwards and make sure it's installed according to plans and specs and any changes that have occurred as a result of the change order through that process I believe that process in place of, for example, the retention pond adjustment came back to us and we had to revisit it. Right. But I don't think there was a change in plans on this particular project. I think it was just an oversight of the plan. Well, I mean, it wasn't an oversight. They're yeah. drawn incorrectly. Bad, bad drawing. If, I mean, it should have been built the way they were drawn. That's what I've been trying to say is, you know, I mean, if they were drawn incorrectly, I'm, I'm sorry, but it should have been built the way they're drawn. And I have a problem with that because it's very unattractive right there on the highway. What part are you talking about at the entrance there, Lucy? Well, when you're looking at the church, the west side, the whole parapet wall is missing. When you're coming east down 96, you just see a corrugated metal roof. You you're know. talking about the top part. Yeah. yeah. Which they have so parapets on three sides. In the drawings, it appears that there should be a parapet wall, but when I, you know, when I ask like, about like it. we've requested down here at Hardest. Yes. To hide the uh, uh, AC. Exactly. Wall. And when I, when I questioned about why was this, you know, why, here's the drawing, mm -hmm. this is what's drawn, why was it built a different so way? Did, did y'all catch it at the planning commission? Well, but see, that's what I'm saying. There was nothing to catch because it was drawn incorrectly. Okay. It should have been built the way it was drawn. I think Where you catch it is after the fact when it's not yep. drawn, you know, built that yep. way. And well, there was, I was actually given that it passed the building inspection. Uh, and actually, uh, John filled out the, and I don't mean to bring up names, but he filled out the temporary CO, and also the fire marshal to give his approval on the sprinkler system, and et cetera. So that's the reason that there was a And I brought that up to, I, I brought the issue up to him. Yeah. And, you know, that's one thing that spurred on the question because, yeah. you know, if it's if it's brought up to the building inspector who i feel like is the person who should you know be the one to say this is how it's drawn this is how it needs to be built because we can't approve anything but what it what we have in front of us yep. the uh, also this is kind of the second time where the shell station on 96 
we approved a plan that mm -hmm. didn't have any of the HVAC units, and then they shown, you know. Right. And, uh, so this kind of being similar, you know, that's kind of what caught my eye a little bit. And uh, and we're talking, min I mean, you know, it's minimal. You know, overall, it's a great looking building. The shell's a great looking building, but you know, just that, you know, one percent, two percent more effort and cost, you know, goes a long way. So. As far as where the air, AC and everything is set at the church, I've already addressed that with Pastor Morgan. And that's, yeah, he, that's... He's, he's put something <clears throat> camouflage at, yeah. and also I've asked him to put some plants around there to sort of hide that a little bit. So. And that can be screened. Yes. The, you know, the HVAC can be screened. Yeah. On a commercial building, that's, that should, I mean, that should not ever be allowed. But right. since this is, I, I don't know what they consider a church now, well, but anyway. The problem is that some churches are actually in residential. You have to address it from a residential. Well, and that's what I'm saying. You know, if it's commercial, the HVAC is on, on the roof. It's right. screened by the parapet wall. And that would have been really bad. If they'd had their HVAC on the roof yeah, and left that parapet yeah. wall out, it would really I mean, it would have even been worse than it is now. But I mean, it's right there on our main, you know, anything that's right on 100 or 96, we've got to be so careful because that's our, that's what people see when they see Fairview. Yeah. So how do we fix it? Let's just all work together. In other words, keep me advised. If I, if I overlook it, then I can maybe correct it before it's... Well, it's, going have, it's going to have to have a step. So and and I'll... Step one, step two, step three. Well, well I, if you have to go back and change step nine, you're going to start back somewhere else. Well, I think one, we need to clear up what what uh, Will said about the design review matching with the requirements, you know, get that taken care of. But then just the enforcement, yeah, I mean, just communication and... Let me, say, let me speak to that, Will. Will, you care if I speak to that right quick? I'm sorry, I, I, was, I was reading. Uh, I'm, I'm going yeah. two different directions. Yeah. Let, let me speak to your, your concerns there. As you know, the three books that we are governed by, so to speak, they don't coincide with one another. Mm -hmm. It is on the project list this year to get Will to work on getting these books compatible with each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tony, have y'all approved that to move forward with that? Do you know? So, are you done yet? Did you know that, Will? <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> but Do we, have we need it next week. I will clarify that. With so we should have it tomorrow. With the city yeah. manager and Tom in the morning. I gave him next or, week. Or Thursday morning won't be here tomorrow. Trust me, I would love nothing more than to just be cut loose on that. So, <laughs> because it would it would eliminate a lot of what we're talking about right now, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, that is in the project list. And it was one of the things that I have been pushing for for a long time. Uh, actually, about two years now, and it will. So, let me address the other thing, Ms. Lisa. So I'm, I'm understanding the objection. Let, let's let's take away the process part and the draw incorrect drawing, all that. The objection to what the look is out there now is the standing seam metal roof being visible from the public right of way? Mm -hmm. Is well, that I mean, what we're talking about? With that, with that portion of parapet wall missing, it just looks incomplete to me. Yeah, okay. the, you know, the design review we have where we don't want to see corrugated metal on a building. Right. Or, and it's not, a, a, it's not an approved, you know, standalone roof right. available. So yeah, that is, uh, I guess, essentially what what it is is it a standing seam metal roof or it's a corrugated metal it's roof. a corrugated metal roof okay yeah. okay because right now standing seam metal roofs and batten metal roofs are allowed okay and there is no requirement for parapet walls to screen those types of metal roofs okay but um, if we receive a drawing that shows a parapet wall and we approve that and then they don't put one in that's my issue. I, I agree completely. I, 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 and when I go to a building inspector and I say, what do we do about this? And he goes, well, you approved it. What kind of answer is that? Not one. Yeah. So where do you go from there? I think that's, you know, a question. Yeah. So does that negate our recourse though? When, so when he what? says, well, that's the drawings, you approve the drawings as they are, is that the dust settles there then? 
I kind of I wonder too if we put the burden on the the builder of the building where we have a just a simple form that we their architect has to turn in that says you know this building is built to what I designed or what was approved yeah you know and I mean anybody that's a, a professional in that field you know everybody gets a little weird signing a piece of paper saying that it's done correctly you know but instead of the city having the foot cost and looking at an architect or that maybe that's part of the CO approval you know you have to get an architectural to approve this has to sign off that the building is built, it's been built in accordance with the plan specifications. Well, that's the thing. I'm not asking because they, they, sh they most likely the architect's doing inspections for, for release of funds. So it's not like that much, but just, you know, maybe that extra step that the city requires. That extra step with this particular case would be making even churches go through a well, yeah, that's a kind of another point that I think we need to, I mean, to me, it's their commercial. commercial Churches thing. should be, I you mean, have I, a, I, I. You have a volume of people meeting in one place. To me, that dictates a commercial. Especially when we look at everything else. We look at the site, we look at the parking, we've got one on the agenda tonight, but we don't look at the building. Yeah. So what steps are taken to make churches part of, you know, commercial instead of, I mean, I, Need to know, I don't even know how. Allow it as a permitted use in residential and only in commercial zoning. Well, that's one option. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that option. Or just saying in the wording that a church has to give through design review. I think follow the I, commercial yeah. design review. I think all we have to do is... I don't want to get fixated on churches because <laughs> it sounds like the the desire of the planning commission would be for any non-residential non for any non-single family residential yeah. use yeah. that is allowed in a residential zone we still want to be subject to the design review requirements and I don't know I haven't looked at the table so I don't know if that would entail more than churches but that would include you know, churches are an allow a non-residential use that are allow is an allowed use in residential zones. Because what if someone built? What if someone had a, a home, and they built like um, some type of um, a barn that they held weddings in or something like that? Mm -hmm. Even though that's residential, to me it should follow the commercial guidelines because it's a large meeting place for events. Well, that, that wouldn't be allowed in the zoning ordinance. Um, I don't think any of your single family residential zones allow a, I can't think, it's not community um, public gathering or. That would be stopped at the time of request for permit. Correct. Yeah. That's what that would stop right there. Actually, I've had someone request the very same thing. Like now, I, I'll tell you this, and Mr. Larry may want to chime in on some of this guys the <laughs> the agritourism lobby has been extremely strong in Tennessee and if you if a landowner is performing a use on that land that falls under the broad category of agritourism they've kind of you, you got to approach it with kid gloves because the state has recognized and there's been several actually in the <clears throat> city limits of Murfreesboro that I'm aware of personally aware of that there are these massive barns that have been converted over to you mm -hmm. know wedding reception areas right and they don't they haven't followed any commercial mm -hmm. building codes or nothing and that's in the city of Murfreesboro, they're trying to figure out how to get their hands on them, but they haven't been able to. And so that's, and I'm not saying we need to, I just want you to be aware that that land use is out there and it's becoming more and more popular um, as you see these little facilities pop up. 
you know, Franklin's dealing with that too because there's a huge life safety issue. Yeah. Congregation of people, right. wood barns, cakes, cigarettes, fires. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's, it's a huge there's deal. one close Candles. to here that I. Whiskey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alcohol. Actually, I, the one that I had actually lives in the county, wanted to be annexed into the city so she could uh, perform the very same thing with their barn. Fortunately, it doesn't touch city property, so it could not be annexed. But I saw the problem at that very same thing. And, you know, that's exactly what they wanted to do was perform weddings there. Unfortunately, uh, I agree with what Will said, and I think you're only going to see it get worse until, before it gets better for this reason. As more and more people are successful in being able to skirt zoning restrictions, safety restrictions, most any other kind of restriction by saying I'm a, an agribusiness, you're going to see more and more of them spring up. And as more and more of them spring up, your odds that something really catastrophic is going to happen goes up. And when you're going to see people get real interested in this is when one of these things catches fire and, and some people unfortunately lose their life. Uh, we as, as a state uh, then everybody's going to be looking at the city saying, why didn't you do something? And they're going to say, justly so, city or county, whoever. We couldn't because the state wouldn't let us. And that's going to happen. I think what another thing we were talking about a few minutes ago with, uh, uh, you know, churches, and I'm not picking on churches, and I'll, I'll just say this briefly, but with them being, being a permitted use in residential, you might as well make them a permitted uh, use in commercial because I don't think you're going to be able to keep them out if you wanted to. Yeah. Because somebody's going to come out there and say you're discriminating against the church, you're mm -hmm. violating my constitutional amendment uh, <clears throat> under uh, the federal and the state constitution, and you're going to end up having to, to have them in there anyway. So the best thing you can do is, is get the best set of plans that you can because so far they haven't, the state government or the federal government hasn't come in and I think if you've got something that you could just prove it was absolutely ultra ridiculous but as long as you, you know, the, the governments have had their thought processes together <coughs> excuse me so far they've been able to require <coughs> safety and this kind of stuff in, in churches because everybody recognizes them as being a place of assembly and they need to be they need to be safe I don't know who started this thing with saying, you know, I can do this business and not have any constraints, but that's virtually what's happened. Uh, I guess if you put it up and said you were going to have one, you were going to have weekly sacrifices or something, you might end up getting a problem. But <laughs> as long as you're doing something, uh, as long as you were doing something that's, uh, you know, a big blowout for the community. Uh, you can just pretty well, you know, you don't have to worry about how many people you got in there. Uh, you know, get 110 in a place that the fire marshal will get 120 and everybody jumps on you. Not in those places. So it, it's something that's going to be, uh, it's going to be a problem. And like Mr. Hall said with the thing about uh, annexations, there's one nice thing about that. Uh, they can't force me to annex you. If I'm, I mean, even if I'm adjacent to the city, if the city is, Basically, whether you annex or don't annex, and there's a lot of things that's happened recently in that field too, uh, but in other words, there's not any more forced annexations and all this kind of stuff. But the expanding or, or constricting of city uh, corporate boundaries is pretty much a legislative function, and the courts will pretty well leave that alone as long as you don't start playing favorites or something like this. You'll annex my property, but you won't annex Mr. Beata's. We're sitting in the same type of a situation, but as long as you stay within reason, uh, you can annex or not annex pretty well whomever you want. But you can't be selective. <laughs> so going back to the meeting place, it's just for my edification here. So we have a drawing that showed the parapet correct and then we've issued a temporary or co use and uno whichever so at this point with that temporary cno being issued 
there is no recourse to go back and say the drawing shows this you need to do this once you once you I assume that they approved what was there to issue the temporary uh, once you've done that you're going to end up in a real bind trying to go back and be an Indian giver on approving yeah. my my plans. I didn't know if the temporary versus the permanent had no, any difference. The temporary or if would be uh, if you find something else, all it is. but it'd be real hard to say I didn't see the wall. Uh, but, I missed the fact that you didn't have ground trip circuit breakers or whatever that yeah. somebody else was supposed to pick up. Probably could, could could do something with that, but it's pretty hard to say. I didn't. That's almost like saying I didn't see the building. Yeah. Actually, John had said it, that the building passed the final. I'm sorry? John actually said the building passed the final, but because uh, the site had not been finished up on the as built drawings, that's the reason we decided to issue a temporary. Because yeah. we Thank still you. have quite a bit of work to be done as far as the I mean, landscaping and everything goes. Just, <clears throat> just bouncing around it. Instead of picking at the three ordinances or the three documents that we have, at some point do we say, let's just make one comprehensive document and just adopt it and just and leave the three where we were at and just kind of create one document of our intentions mm -hmm. instead of spending so much time trying to right. pick through That's all the idea. changes we made. I don't know. Will's part goes because he, he, he has a, a, a big job of going through all three no, books absolutely. and making sure everything is as close mm -hmm. as possible. <laughs> and, and I know he's, uh, in some of my research, the zoning actually states in there the design too. But then you got a separate design manual over here that says something different. Uh, one thing that I run into this week was a manufactured home versus a mobile home. Nowhere in our uh, zoning does it say mobile home until you get to the chart and it says it's permitted. Other than that, it says it's a manufactured home. So uh, those are the type of things that we're having to deal with. And you know, until you get in and start reading, that's when you really find out the differences in everything. But, like perhaps we have uh, you know workshops where we all get together and go through different documents of those and and find our intentions and our plans. It just sometimes it feels like we're chasing backwards so much trying to compare and contrast rather than just like well this is what we want let's put it all here yeah, one forget book where we and were and this is what yeah. we need to do now yeah, right? yeah. i think we would Wouldn't love that, be that easier, will? will to just have one book instead of yeah well it, three that don't job here here's here's what um, what mr larry's about to say that i'll just go ahead and put it out there the it is necessary to have the three separate documents because they enforce three different things. You couldn't have uh, subsections, me, or you, you could potentially you could potentially have the design review manual housed within the zoning ordinance. That could potentially be an option. Maybe I'll have to explore that with with Larry a little bit more, but. You absolutely have to have a differentiation between subdivision regulations and a zoning ordinance. Legally, there's no way to combine the two. And I'm not aware of any community in the state that has a combined document of those two because one, one is under the full purview and, and authority of the commission or council, and that's the zoning ordinance. And the other, and that deals with land use and the other the sub regs is under the full authority and purview of the planning commission and that all that dictates is the manner in which land is divided and the public infrastructure that is associated with those divisions of land road water sewer storm drainage so i, I think there may be some opportunity there to house the design review requirements within a subsection of the zoning ordinance but the sub regs and the zoning ordinance have to stay separate the other thing that i think is going to be most beneficial is to remove don't try to regulate the same thing in all three documents if it's regulated in this one omit it completely from the other mm -hmm. two there's no need to to repeat because and that's what you find is we will get staff or whoever at the time, the planning commission will get fixated on a particular aspect of the zoning ordinance and we'll change that 
but unknowingly or, or innocently, we won't go back and look, oh, well, that's also regulated over here, so now we need to change that. We need to get completely independent documents of one another so they're standalone and there's not any crossover. That's what I thought we had asked you to do some time ago. So, Wayne, if you could check on that, see if we need it. Not, you put it on, not this one, but the next BOC meeting. If if we move forward with it, Tom will have to probably come to y'all for a, a budget amendment, which, <laughs> which is part of. And I so, think Will's already <laughs> given us a, a, some sort of some sort of a idea of the cost. So. Yeah, I was going to say. So, is the intent to to salvage what we have, or is the intent to scrap exactly it? Exactly what he said. <laughs> Just to be clean it up. Have it in three different categories, and have it go back and regulate it each one. Am I right, William? Yes. My, my intent, unless given a different directive, my intent would be to not necessarily go back and see how we got to this requirement, but to take that requirement and my having been with you guys now for oh goodness, seven eight years, Fabulous. and understanding kind of some of your desires I would ask and this is this is really risky on my part <laughs> I would ask for some autonomy to be able to make some decisions <coughs> certainly we would present a draft version of all the documents for you to review at at a great length or however long a time you wanted and say no we don't like this aspect or we and and, and you need to be involved in the actual components of setting a minimum building set is just an example we want the minimum building setback for the r20 zone to be 35 feet if that's what you want that's great i'm not going to interject my thoughts on that at all because that's it's your document but allowing me some autonomy in the process the documents and how and when they're submitted how they're when they're reviewed, the approval process of going through, particularly with PUDs, I mean, that, that whole section needs to be gutted and just mm -hmm. revamped, made a lot more simplistic to read, but without, when I say gutted, I don't mean gut the requirements and the restrictions, I mean gut the com complexities of it, make it very clear on what's required, and the requirements would still be there, so we're not lessening the de requirements on developers. We're just making it more clear to them and to us as a staff and to you as a planning commission. That would be my overall overarching intent of looking at the three documents and revising. them. And then also yeah. determining if there's duplicates, if it shows up in this document, this document, which one does it belong in? Right. You have to, it's going away from one. So where does it make the most sense that it ends up? Yes. <clears throat> and, and, and it's, it's not just those three documents. There are standalone city ordinances that have been adopted that affect those three documents. The one that comes to mind immediately is uh, the tree ordinance. And so take the tree ordinance, and again, I know this is risky, but I, I am fully convicted this is what's best for the city. Take the tree ordinance, incorporate what you want as a planning commission for those restrictions on landscaping and preserving existing trees and, 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 and vegetation, house them in the zoning ordinance under a landscaping requirements provision, and make the tree ordinance null and void. You still have the restrictions in place. You still have the enforcement. You still have the oversight. You still have the ability to utilize the city arborist and his expertise during the staff review of those plans and use that to move forward and not have to be darting all the all around all these different documents yeah and that's what that's kind of what i envision is a new document that's adopted we're no longer oh wait this this ordinance was revised in 2004 we never we never caught this uh, just a new document that overrides any previous yes mm -hmm. you know question what, what my suggestion would be once you're comfortable with the three documents you, you will, the subdivi subdivision regulations, you can adopt wholly and independently on, on your own as a planning commission. So that's done. The zoning ordinance and design review manual, you would recommend to the BOC for adoption as presented to them. 
and they would and they would adopt them let's just assume they are in agreement they would adopt them in their entirety so after those actions are taken you have three completely new documents not a revision to a section of this document a whole new document in their entirety so we're not trying to and then from that point forward as a city you have to task your city staff with not only keeping up with revisions to specific sections from that point forward but incorporating them into the parent document and what most communities will do is they will they will reprint that document once a year with any changes that have taken place and you will adopt that entirety document again annually and so you keep up with your annual changes as the years go by and you don't end up 10 years down the road with 20 changes revisions to a sentence or a section that were never incorporated into either what's on your website or what what I'm reviewing against or anyone else or you give to developers for them to design their plans again <laughs> right right so I I mean I think I think the time is now um, and and mr. Tony you're correct we, we have and I have hit on it in the past that my kind of marching orders were to to identify sections that were in discrepancy as 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 budget as city budget and and time allowed and so we've kind of done that but I think the time is here where you need you need to have again I'm just way out on a limb tonight but you need to have your BOC commit to a contractual amount whether it's me or anybody else I I certainly want the work but I, I think it's in the city's best interest to have that done um, and and to be better prepared to move forward with uh, you know smart growth and accounting for the growth that's, that you're going to see agree we look back on it but I believe we had an estimate on it okay all right Wayne. we do Okay. That's, that's yeah. why, that's why the estimate's $30,000. $30,000. And just for my clarification, <clears throat> so if I'll switch it to a restaurant, there's a restaurant being built and they're building something that doesn't match the plan or what we've approved. What's the process going forward with that? Um, I think let's back up one more step. When when you approve a plan for a restaurant at the planning commission level, you're approving the site plan and the design review components, the elevations. You're not approving the actual building plans, the structural building plans. The plumbing, mechanical, electrical, you don't, you never see those, and that's always the case. And that's, I'm talking more aesthetic. Yes, correct. And, okay. and that's common. That's, that's, that's not uncommon uh, for planning commission not to see that. I think the, the issue, or, or the key is going to be, when your building official receives those building plans, somebody somewhere needs to take those building plans that the building official actually stamps for the structure itself Look at there. And either make sure they're in compliance with the approved aesthetics part that the planning commission or that any sheets that well I mean that's it and there's a couple ways you can go about doing that but that's 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 the nuts and bolts of it is that when those building plans come in for the actual building permit when they come to see Ms. Sharon and get a building permit they submit her building plan that's when those plans need to be reviewed and there needs to be coordination between the approved planning commission plans and the approved building plans for the final sure, revision and to make sure that before the building permit yeah but for the permit those building plans are in, in accordance with the approved planning commission plan. so then let's assume those two sets of plans are in agreement the building permit is issued now we have the building inspector goes out notices that um, there's a change that's been made my suggestion is that the building inspector makes the whoever the owner's representative aware of the discrepancy.
discrepancy between the approved plans and what we see in the field. Uh, they need to probably have a discussion on staff needs to make a determination and there's guidelines in for these documents on if it constitutes a change that would require to come back to the planning commission for approval. That's where the road meets the road on it needs to be determined by staff. There needs to be a record documenting what the decision was by the staff on what the change was. And if it wasn't, if it was deemed not necessary to come back to the planning commission, then somebody, the building official, needs to sign off on that and, and accept that as, as his decision that was written. Does that kind of get to where you're well, I mean, is the building inspector the one who should say you're not building this according to the plans so you you're not you know he's the only one that, that's going to know that during throughout construction unless it's brought to other people's attention I mean, no well i mean if it's brought to his attention by someone else yes. then he should i mean i'm not picking on the church either i'm just using that as an example but any of that could happen with any building sure. that's being built. Yeah. It's just that, I mean, in the process where he, he would say, this is what we, you know, the planning commission approved. Right. This is the, your building plans. This, you know, and it's not being followed. Right. And then at that point, the applicant or the owner or the builder or whoever, they have a choice. They can continue on. I mean, we can't force them um, to come to the planning we can issue a stop work order. That, that can be done. It's going to have to be documented on why. Um, and then ultimately, we can withhold the CO if it's, the plan is not in compliance with the proof. If, if the finished construction is not in compliance with the approved plan. And, and if you withhold CO, then that's your leverage point. Well, there, this has been good discussion. We're running right up on the time for the, plan, the actual planning commission meeting. Should we try to, um, should we try to talk about this quickly, the turn lanes, or should we try to um, set another workshop? What do you think, Mr. Hall? Uh, we can set another workshop, but the reason I'm bringing this is because of our road situation and the future traffic that's going to hit them, I feel that it's necessary for us to put this in our regulations. Uh, I've recommended 25 lots or more. That would be the Planning Commission's uh, recommendation if they want to make it less or if they want to make it more. But I think uh, we have a couple of situations right now. I wish that this would have been in place before they ever started because it would really help. You know, there's so 40, what, 50 lot um, subdivision. So <clears throat> if you want to bring it back to the next meeting, uh, that's fine with me. And y'all can be thinking about it in the meantime. So this is something that might be a good idea to have added? Yes, because of our roads. You know, our roads are narrow. And when you start adding that much more traffic to certain areas, I think turning lanes would be a big help for the neighborhood. One of those, I don't mind saying, is Deer Valley Downs. That crow cut is real narrow right there by the park, and it's right on the crest of a hill. If they'd have had turning lanes uh, required there, then they could have been put in, you know, prior to the, the houses being built right up, right up next to the road. So, but, uh, and that, that's occurring more and more. So if we required in our regulations, we don't have to wait on a traffic study to, re, to do that. So. Uh, Larry and uh, uh, Will were going to uh, tell us the process, what we'd have to go through, but I think that should wait to the next uh, meeting to determine that. I don't know if there's any way to also talk about, or adding to that workshop, talk about buffers, like entry buffers. I'd like to just discuss a little more of a setback off of like a main street, um, an entry into a neighborhood, just to discuss that a little bit more about what our restrictions are, what possibilities are, and 
things like that. It'd help with road visibility. Absolutely. And it would help with traffic. You know, if your first house is 15 feet from the entrance, it's going to, you know, adjust flow a little bit. But if you're set back 50, 75 feet or something like that from the road, it would, it would help flow. Yes, yeah. it would. Are y'all wanting a workshop for next month? If we're going to add a workshop to discuss more. And then you want the other one? Uh, that, buffer? Uh, for buffer. 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 Yeah. Well, Entry book. We can set the workshop if there's something comes up. We can let it do it. Oh, it's my birthday. October 11th. Happy birthday. <laughs> I mean, it's not today. I'm talking about next month's planning commission <laughs> meeting. <laughs> Early birthday. So that would be 6 p.m. October 11th. We'll discuss turn lanes, subdivisions of 25 lots or more, and then entry buffers. Okay, so we're going to adjourn the workshop meeting and take a... Five, 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 yeah, that's what I was going to say. We'll take five minutes and we'll start...